and welcome to Mind Matters, a mini series on mental health where we share the stories of students and community leaders. I'm Sachelle Harris. In this episode, founder and executive director of Thrival Academy, India Johnson, and founder and executive director of Purpose for My Pain, Deandra Dykus, sit down with Brittany Day and Brandon Randall to reflect on their passion for young people and what communities can do to better serve them. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. Brittany and Brandon, take it away. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are going to kick off our second taping of our mini podcast series. This time we have some local indie ed leaders that are coming to the call today. So India would love to kick things off by having you start off by telling us um, your name (laughs) and the hat you are wearing in this call. My name is India Johnson and the hat that I'm wearing in this call, what's the hat that I'm wearing in this call? Um, Founder and executive director of Thrival India Academy. And Deandra, same question, please. All right, my name is Deandra Dykus, and the hat that I'm wearing in this call is I'm the founder and executive director of Purpose for My Pain. Awesome. So, first of all, I'm excited that you both are here today. The, I know both of you, and I know that you have you know amazing passion for young people and for the community. Um, so, kind of to kick off the conversation. So, when we did our recording with Ronell and Cameron. Um, and then just talking to other young people in general. Um, so we look at ambitions, right? Looking at proud moments uh, that young people, you know, have had and want to uh, share with others. So specifically with the two young men that we talked with before. So Cameron is a musician, rapper. He actually created his own label. Um, and then Ra- Ronell is an entrepreneur. He's working on real estate and e-commerce. So from both of your perspectives, when we look at education or even community leadership, how are our systems, whether they're education or just community interaction, how are they nurturing young people's career and college goals? And then how can that be strengthened? So basically what are we doing well with these systems on encouraging young people to aspire to their dreams and then what are we still needing to work on and Deandra we'll start with you I was hoping you start with the educator over there and I'm just kidding (laughs) well the first thing that comes to mind for me is making sure I I believe that people are bringing more awareness to um, life goals or career paths that don't necessarily lead to a four-year degree but that people are still able to do well in such as manufacturing real estate. And I listened to those young men and was pretty impressed by the record label being established and having five or six artists on the label already. That's impressive and not necessarily something that someone told him he had to go get a bachelor's degree for to obtain. And I just think that that's important um, that we, we, we bring that into kids and say, hey, bachelor's degree, master's, that's awesome, but it's not your only way to success. And so as far as the community goes and educational um, facilities, just making sure that they they, uh, enforce that upon the kids in high school when there's preparation for getting ready for what life looks like after, letting them know all the options that they have. And as far as the community goes, making sure that we're creating those platforms to say, hey, I I got one from the YMCA the other day, manufacturing certifications. Uh, They're doing a three week program that's actually being offered by Purdue free of charge for young people 16 to 24 to come in and learn about that. And I thought that was great because I know for me, my junior in high school, he's not going to college. He, he's already made that <laughs> quite clear to me. And I said, okay, what's a plan look like afterwards? Absolutely. Um, and thank you for sharing that important resource. India, what about you? You know, coming from your perspective in the school, what do you think that we're doing well? And then what do we need to do better at? Okay, so we know I'm if I'm nothing, I am hypercritical of all systems. So it's almost difficult for me to think of something we're doing well, but then I was thinking, 
oh, you know, the graduation pathways um, and CTE, that is something that is going in the right direction where it's not just you have to pass a high stakes exam and you um, have to do these things that will get you into college because we know college is not for everybody. It's really not even for most people. It's supposed to be something that's for specific career paths. Um, so the state at least is moving in the right direction with that. What we need to do as a school system, I know what my school is doing, but I can't, I have to act like my school isn't doing these things. Just think about system-wide, we're not really exposing our students to career paths outside of what's been traditionally exposed by, um, you know, white culture, basically. So even starting a um, record label is not even something that would even cross the minds of the people who are in charge because that's not, you know, in their universe. So I think as the universe, as, as the universe expands like each individual individual person brings their own universe into this thing so when I came into educational leadership I brought east side experiences with me army kid experiences lgbtq person experiences those things so then the systems universe expanded so as we continue to bring in people with diverse experiences and backgrounds then the way that the system is interacting with its people will naturally expand Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Emmy, you said that, you know, certain, certain hopes and dreams don't fit that traditional model. And so how do we get more administrators, uh, superintendents, how do we get more folks who are these gatekeepers to have that exposure, but not just get the exposure, but be willing to involve or be more inclusive of these, I don't want to call it non-traditional because it's traditional depending on your perspective, but these career goals, these aspirations that maybe aren't as commonly recognized, how do we get gatekeepers to do a better job at recognizing them? So my first uh, response is we can't change the people, we have to change the people. Uh, that's just what it comes down to. I'm tired of trying to change these people. We just got to change people. It's, it, they don't need to be in these positions anymore. And that's just the hard truth about it. Uh, so as more people like you and I rise and we can take the spots of these people who refuse to see the world as it should be, be because they're so committed to the world as it is. They know that not everybody becomes a doctor. They know, they know that what they're doing is setting students up for failure. They are just committed to continuing to do it this way. They're not going to change. If they were going to change, they would have changed by now. Um, so, but then the other part of that is for people who really desire to expose students to more, but just don't have it, um, don't have that access. It is about creating an environment where people who don't have their same backgrounds and experiences feel welcome. Because when I worked at the schools where I worked, I did not feel welcome to express my opinions. I did not feel welcome to actually advocate for change. So then I would leave. If I'm just gonna be here to be a token, then I don't need to be here. So they, these leaders really have to humble themselves, like get their ego out of the way and be open to um, criticism and be open to suggestions and being open to hear things that they're not used to hearing. Absolutely, thank you so much. So both of the students kind of spoke to their current happenings with entrepreneurship and with music as well. But then they went on to Ronell define success as wealth and Cam mentioned the importance of continuing to save. And so as Brandon and I were talking in preparation for this call, we both mentioned like, we don't see enough of this in our own experiences with being like, a required course in schools, such around personal finance, credit, life skills. So just wanted to get both of your takes on like, how are schools truly preparing students in regards to these topics? Wow. 
um, me and my son talk about that all the time. That's why I said, wow. And I think about it uh, a lot as myself being an entrepreneur and how no one taught me this. This was passion and pure purpose that I feel like led me to this place. You know, I remember being in high school and learning maybe how to write a check. Uh, my son, his sophomore year, took a finance class and they learned how to write checks and prepare budgets. But you know what the budget was for? Paying back student loans. Like it was how to pay back student loans and, oh, your mortgage. So we know all kids coming out of college or high school are not going to be homeowners at an instant. It didn't say groceries. It didn't say child care for those that come out of school being parents like I did. Um, so from my perspective, it's not being taught enough. Um, there needs to be an entire class of what it looks like to just step out on your own. Um, if I don't attend college or even after college, what, is it, what does it look like to save? What does it look like to balance my checkbook? What does it look like to invest? What's a 401k? All of those things that I have now learned as a business owner, what does it look like for me to have benefits if I don't work for an employer? Who do I go to for that? Just had someone email me about benefits and she had it all wrong, but she said, I'm a young entrepreneur and I have no idea what I'm talking about. So for me, I got excited because I get to educate her on that. But it's things that people, uh, the education system is not preparing. And one thing I keep bringing up my son because he just says some very unique things um, <laughs> as a 16 year old. And he said, mom, I wish that I could create a school that teaches people real life. And I said, you should go create that school <laughs> to teach people real life because he thinks taking algebra three, four is stupid and he'll never know. And I'm like, well, it depends on the career path you go down. I'm not gonna say it's stupid, but it's not prop proper pr preparation for what you wanna do. And so I think schools and education systems um, definitely need to begin gauging those kind of things. But I really like what India said, how she said, we need to change the people by changing the people because their purpose is to put these systematic things in, in place so that our kids don't succeed the way that we desire to. So hats off to educators like her who are looking through a different lens. Thank you. Yeah, I'm your son. You know, you should introduce us. That's what it was for me. I've always struggled with the concept of traditional school. It always seemed gratuitous, or superfluous, um, like a waste of time. It yeah. felt like I was being punished for not fitting in when I just kept being like, I, I wasn't created to be you. I was created to be me. And I would always get in trouble for that. And we were learning things that seemed quite unnecessary. And then I got into real life popping off on my parents. Like, why are we all buying TVs and not help me pay for my student loan, pay for college? Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is that who gonna teach it if we never learned it? So, you know, everybody says we never learn these things. Also educators never learn them. And educators are the furthest thing from entrepreneurs. Educators are really the furthest thing from any kind of out the box thinkers because we've stayed in the same career that we've, we stayed in the same environment we've been in since we were five years old, literally. We've never done anything different from what we were doing when we were since we were three, four or five years old, unless you're somebody like me who became an educational entrepreneur. Other than that, they really have, we, we, we become like, what is it, cogs on the belt or whatever? Like we just become part of this system and, and are so indoctrinated and we're indoctrinated into indoctrinating other people. That's really what educators have become. It's really, it's sad. And it might be what was it, what we were intended to be from the beginning. So then you have people like me come along and like, no, I'm not doing this. We tend to get consequenced out of our positions because we refuse to follow these rules that make no sense. Um, so yeah, they prepare us to pay, to be in debt. You know, it's not even just that they're, that they're saying like, oh, we're going to teach you how to budget. It doesn't matter what they're teaching you how to budget for, it's debt. And they're preparing us to be people who are indebted to other people. And they're normalizing that fact. Those are problems. So again, like that's what's happening in these school systems overall. But I intentionally only employ people who are just like me. We call ourselves like the, we're like the hip, the hippies and beatniks or something, you know, like we are just 
the people who are like, I don't understand why humans are doing what they're doing. This is what I wish I was getting. And that's what we give to our students. It's like, I need to see you all skyrocket. We don't want to suppress them. We want to see them go as far as the universe can possibly take them. I need to get a Darius a job at your school when he graduates next year. <laughs> Absolutely, 100%. I wish, this is what I'm trying to get funding. If I had the funding, I would employ everybody I could who, yeah. because I know I'm one of the only good people employing people around here. And I like, I really just want to do it all. I promise I do. I want to save the whole world. I'm going to. It makes me think about the awkward kid. Can I add a comment? Do you mind? Okay, so I have Darius in totally out of the box for him. I enrolled him in CLD. So my son is uh, Asperger's and has some anxiety and depression disorder. So that just kind of lets you know about putting him in CLD. <laughs> I was just trying to break him out the box and trying to get him to think about what after high school looks like, even if it wasn't college. And so they went around asking, what college do you want to go to and different things? And Darius said, I'm not going to college because I won't make enough money to pay it back. And so the instructor texted me. She said, can you try to help Darius come up with a more creative way to respond? Because this is a college program. <laughs> and I said, well, for one, he was very honest. Um, but I didn't want him in there discouraging other people, I guess, from not going to college. So I did work with him on what he said, but that was his response. He said, I won't be able to afford to pay it back. So that's one reason why I'm not going. And there's a young lady that I mentor. And when I think about what India said about uh, educators are being trained to indoctrine, and I had this lunch with her and that's like, it was nothing but college. There was no out of the box thinking. And she said, I don't really have parent support. So DeAndra, here's my plan to pay the $40,000 a year because she's going out of state. And I, I just sat there. I was impressed by her plan. I was impressed, but I also, my heart kind of, you know, went out to her because it was, I have to do this or I won't be successful. And that is actually, you're, you're absolutely right. That's what they've been trained to think. If I don't do this, then there's no other path for me even if it's gonna cost me $160,000 to make this. Cause she told me it's, you know, 40 grand a year. I'm, I'm literally just trying to let it all just kind of sit in a bit. Cause there's so many great points have been made. And so I know I start off like saying my, from my own experience like it hasn't really been a thing. The personal finance class I took in high school was an elective, Yeah, you know? And Brandon and I also talked about the predatory lending that sometimes people experience. I remember being on a college campus and they're outside of the restaurants, the fast food joints, selling or, or giving out applications for a credit card if you want free food. Wow. So, like make it make sense, right? <laughs> but it's important also that what I'm hearing is of making the connections of what they're learning in the school to the real world. Mm -hmm. And I can give you some good examples of that just from this past week. So I was preparing for um, a board, our board meeting, and I was working on a budget reconciliation. Tay, who thinks he's my son at this point, anybody who's a social media friend is seeing Tay because he stays in my office. He's just brilliant. So he gets done with his work pretty fast. And then the teachers are like, go ahead and go hang with your mom. He's decided I'm his mom. So he's standing behind me being nosy. And I let them just watch me work. And I'm doing this budget and I'm, um, I think for the month we had spent like $76,000 or something like that. And I was trying to, I was off by like $92 or something. And it was driving me crazy. I'm like, I have to find this. And so I'm going through and then I find the number. He's watching me this whole time and I find it and it came out perfectly. And I was so fulfilled. And I was like, oh my God, I just saw y'all doing this in math class. I'm doing algebra. Like you were balancing this equation. He was like, you found the missing number. And I was like, I did, I found the missing number. <laughs> like we were so, and I was like, you take, I had to take algebra twice. You know, I always struggled with algebra and I will always say math isn't my thing. I'm an English teacher. And so he watched me be really proud of myself for doing algebra after they all know that I was somebody who even struggled with it. Um, so that was one. And then 
And I'm a, I am empowered to do this because our math teacher is phenomenal. And she has our students doing real life math every day. And she tells them, I'm having you redecorate my house. So here's the square footage of it. Here's my budget. And she, they're literally redecorating her house for her. That's their project. And she's going to take one of their one of their plans and do it in their house and like well can we get you some drapes can we paint and she's like whatever's in the budget you know whoever has the best one that's what i'm going to use and so we in every single class that's what we do we make it very personal we make it real life Brittany, when you and i were teaching at ajb together i was purchasing my home and i was an english teacher and i would be up there telling the kids like what y'all what they didn't teach me was and like i'm teaching these eighth graders this stuff because we're, they're not gonna catch us slipping this next time around so that's how we do it Yeah, that, so, and it's interesting because even in that conversation, like you're hearing the importance of connection, right? Like, I think I get frustrated because I see so many people, whether they're educators or gatekeepers, like wearing this mask of fraudulence in order to try to gain connection. And it's like, when do we start being real? Like, I, I remember, you know, that show on MTV, The Real World, and that's, they started every episode out, you know, when strangers come together and start being real. It's like, how do we get back to that? Like, how do we learn how to be vulnerable and authentic? And I know India loves it when I talk about audacious, right? Like, how do we get to that? And so, like, when we talk to Cameron and Ronell, we asked them about this whole concept of, you know, it takes a village. And, you know, I feel blessed that, you know, both of them, you know, said that I have been, um, you know, a pretty integral part of their life in the very short time that I've known them. And I appreciated that, but I also wanted to know why. And so it really came down to loyalty, dependability, and trust. So can both of you talk about, like, in your capacity, whether it's community and education, both? Um, talk about how you are cultivating relationships. Like India, you created a whole school, <laughs> a whole school based on relationships. So if both of you can kind of just talk about like what, what cultivating relationships looks like to you and why is it so important? And India, we can start with you. Yeah, because I wanted to start this time. Um, I, start. I think <laughs> I have deemed myself the East Side Healer. And like, I've just come into this thing that I've always been doing probably my whole life. I was just doing it through a place of pain. But most of the work that I do at this point is about helping people heal themselves so that they can be their best people to other people and for other people. Because I realize like my, I'm struggling right now to get um, support and all these things because there's a whole lot of like, jealousy and resentment and envy that's getting in the way of us like moving our community forward and it's not just towards me it's towards a lot of people who are simply trying to do the right thing trying to do the best thing for our community and I can't blame people for that like we there's a lot of pain that we're carrying and pain manifests the way that it manifests so in order for us to have meaningful relationships we have to be in a place of active healing and evolving we have to be able to be vulnerable but that means that everyone has to let down their walls at the same time and it comes from leadership my staff knows like give yourself grace is one of my was a phrase that I just use all the time I didn't even know it was rare you know like they're so shocked by it um they know when I'm struggling they went through my divorce with me I've gone I've grieved with them about their family members that we've lost and we are just everyone is welcome to have the day that they're having. When they're having a bad day, when they're having a moment, they can call me or they can text me and say, I need to step away. I mean, our place is a place of healing. So usually they need to be in the building. Um, but you know, whatever it is, they can call me, I'll go to their house, but it's just because they know that they can, I'm not gonna judge them. I'm not going to consequence them for being human. And there are a lot of leaders who like to pretend like they have it all together and they're actually falling apart. And since they aren't okay being open about what's going on with them, they consequence it out of everybody else. They shame people for being broken, even though they too are broken people. 
it's insecurity. So we, you have to embrace healing. I'm just going to talk about healing to the day I die, because um, if you're not doing that healing, then everything else is going to fall apart. It's not going to work. I don't know if there's anything else left to say. <laughs> <laughs> that healing piece, I think it's so key. The first thing that comes to mind when you ask the question though, is removing the mask. And if I cannot be transparent and be my true self, then I don't need to be in this work. So every day I am working with a family impacted by gun violence. And my reminder just popped up. I have to go pick up a young lady who was shot five times from the airport when I'm done with this. That is what I do every single day of my life. So if I can't be transparent about having a bad day, or as we say in our support group, being okay with not being okay, then I don't need to be in this space. So it's just important to remove that mask and be transparent so we can even start the journey of healing. Because there is no starting if I can't be honest in, in, in that space. So it's important that we create that space so that there can be that honesty. So when we have leaders wearing their mask and then going home or going out and um, facing something so much different than they're portraying, they're really hurting the community. They're really hurting the people that they are impacting. So India said a mouthful when she said about the jealousy and the pain, I'll be honest, sometimes that's such a distraction and I don't realize that they're just hurting because I believe that hurt people can heal people. And that is why I entered this space because I grieve who my son would have been, who my son could have been or was to be, but I'm taking that pain and I'm working to help others heal as I'm on my healing journey. I don't go around saying I've been healed of my son been shot in the head. That is a lie. <laughs> but what I am saying is let's enter this space and go on this journey of healing together because I'm honest and I'm, I'm very honest when I say to people, my son's still here, yours is not. I cannot say I know what it feels like to lose a child in the physical. So I have to have those honest conversations. The young lady I'm picking up, she was shot five times. And so we relate in the fact that she knows what it is to live an injured. And then we'll have those conversations where, my God, there's sometimes survivor remorse when we interact with people who have lost to gun violence. But we go into those conversations very honest and that's why we're able to connect the, uh, connect the way we do and we're able to you know, share that to others. So I just say, I sum it up with saying, we got to remove the mask in order to really move forward and really to begin to heal ourselves and our community. And just because you said that remove the mask piece, there's a very important piece that I forgot to mention. Um, we're talking about when it comes to the school system, the school system is like 80 to 90% of Indiana white white people from Indiana, and we're going to be honest about it, there is a lot that is not discussed from white educators who work with black and brown population about the racism that they grew up in, about the racist beliefs that they still hold. So if they remove the mask, the mask would, under that would just be a, a racist mask. So they have to pretend to be whatever it is. And it's going to be authentic. It's going to be inauthentic. It's going to be performative because under that performance is a racist person or a person with racist beliefs. And, and then there's a whole lot of generational healing that would have to take place in order for them to really undo that in systemic healing. So let's be honest, it ain't going to happen. You know, we can't say I cannot, I will not try to take a racist person and make them not racist over the course of my lifetime. That is not something for me to do. The same way that I, in my bloodline, carry ancestral trauma from the impacts of slavery, Jim Crow, and the civil rights movement, so do they. Mm -hmm. They also carry that ancestral trauma and it's impacting the way they interact with the world as well. Somebody's gonna have to do that work. That is not for me to do. So I don't know what to do outside of making the making education more welcoming to people like me who tend to get fired. I got fired from two schools, you know, making it more welcome for people like me who are actually here to change the system as opposed to making it just a place where people perpetuate the system as it is, because it's still going to be the racist system that it's always been. You know, and it's interesting because, so when you, 
you hear this phrase, I think I've heard this phrase in some like DEI training or interrupting racism, but it's called exaggerated visibility. And basically it's when a young person feels that they are not being seen or affirmed or humanized in their authentic state, they will exaggerate their presence to make sure damn well you are going to see them. But it makes me think of that, uh, that proverb, a child not embraced by the village will burn it down to fill its, uh, to fill its warmth. But here's my question. We have people out here who see the village is on fire, know that it's on fire so young people are getting that warmth, but they're intentionally putting out that fire thinking that they're doing some sort of good deed instead of realizing that they are enabling the dehumanization out of these kids who are not fitting the mold. So my question for you two is, A, how do you use your skill set to make the other kids feel like they're, there's nothing wrong with them? And how do you vet the people you allow in your circle? Oh, I'm sorry, I gotta go. I have to, because I don't wanna forget it. I'm sorry, Deandra. One, um, every kid is that other kid. You have the ones who are like me, who are just like, what, I don't care. I'm gonna be me no matter what, no matter how many whoopings I get, no matter how times I get suspended, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna be me. And then you have the most of the kids who just silence themselves and like lose themselves and shrink themselves. But every single person, is an individual person. There is no blueprint for any of us. So we embrace, I think a lot of kids come in and are, you know, like they just intend to be copy paste humans. And in my building, you're not gonna be a copy paste human. When I see people, I see directly to their soul. I speak to their soul. I understand this about myself. So I look at a kid and I can tell you 15 years from now, what are the possibilities for you? And we're gonna focus on that. And we're going to, I'm going to gas you up. I'm going to hype you up about the clothes that you're wearing. Your, your, you wear your hair different. I'm hyping that up too. We encourage that behavior. That's why we don't have uniforms. That's why we don't have bills. We encourage that. Um, so you don't, it's, you know, there's no space for anybody to just fit in. There's no fitting in. We're all weirdos. And I say that we just embrace it. Every last one of us is a weirdo. Um, and then I am very particular about who we keep our circle tight is what we say. We keep our circle tight. And again, like I'm not going to do business the way that everybody else does it. I am an empath. I feel feelings. I feel everybody else's feelings. So within two minutes, I know whether or not you're one, a, a person who should be in this building or not. I know like I can hear from your history. Are you someone who has a problem with the way the system is now and desire to change it? I don't really care about the content mastery because I can I'm a I'm an amazing coach an amazing leader so I can get that out of you but if you're trying to burn the system down this is where you belong and I will go out and I will find those people we are the kids who set the village on fire and the village is currently feeling my warmth your warmth DeAndra's warmth you know what I, it just is what it is um so and and that's another reason why my staff is the most racially reflective staff in the city. I have the most black people employed, you know, the ratio of the most black people employed in this city, probably in this state. But it's because I don't care that you taught at a bunch of different schools before you came here. Actually, I'm impressed by that because you're like me, because I also taught, but you weren't with it. You were not with what was going on there. You never bought into that. Um, we, I embrace that and I am able to openly ask the white people I interview, this is a school that number one is about embracing and uplifting the humanity of all people. We don't go around saying we're anti-racist. Well, we like, but you know, we speak very openly about the impact of racism and I don't need to put a label on it. You know, we, and we have a black centered a diaspora, African diaspora centered curriculum, because why not? I, I had to learn from a Eurocentric curriculum. And when I hear from them, I acknowledge that I have bias. I acknowledge that there are some beliefs that I have held that 
um, are rooted in racism, I'm like, you're hired because that's all I need to hear from you. If you're a, I don't see color person, you don't have any business around me. If you're someone who denies that there's any parts of yourself that still might hold privilege or bias or some beliefs that your grandpa or mother taught you, then I can't because you're in denial. But if you can be open and honest about it, then we have a starting place and you actually care to be and do better. I'm trying to make sure I remember the question after that. <laughs> but so I was looking at my notes. And one thing, one thing is bringing people into our organization or just people that I connect with with my work outside of my organization. I'm not looking for people, looking to connect with people who are trying to save my community. And so if, if that's the attitude that you portray, and I'm like India, I can pick up on it very quickly. <laughs> I remember meeting with this lady and she, she said, I would love to work with you, but I don't want to appear as a white Barbie from the suburbs trying to save POCs. This is what she said. <laughs> and I, I looked at my phone to make sure I'm like, who in the world am I? I said, trying to save a POC. I said, first of all, coming into our community using that kind of language, you will never connect with anyone. I, we're not looking for white Barbies, nor are we looking for saviors. And so that's that's one thing that I look for. If you're looking to save my community, but not looking to come alongside me, then I don't want to work with you. And so that's the that's the key thing for me is I we we can link arms or we can stay spread apart, but you're not coming to save. You know, we 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 have a savior. We're not we're not looking for anybody to save us. I know that's right, but <laughs> I often reflect on origin stories, and at this point, that's that's what I respect is an origin story, and if it's like, oh, well, I had students my first year who couldn't eat or had to sell drugs in order to buy a pair of shoes, buy, that's not, that's not your origin story. Right. You are profiting off of somebody else's pain in this very weird, weird way. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't connect with people who are outsiders doing this work. I don't, it, for me, it is very, I'm like literally healing myself and the generations before me by doing the work that I'm doing. And that is very important to me. It's very deep and personal. I don't really have space for people who don't take it that personally. Mm -hmm. It has to be like, I feel this deeply. Even if you like, I don't, I don't know Brandon's origin story, but I know that he is rooted in something deep and personal for, for him. I can feel it. We all can discern that. And that's what it has to be. If it's just like, this is a job that I was offered or um, I have some guilt, some privileged guilt, and I just want to come back and, and like make myself feel better. We don't have time for that. You're, it has to be personal. This work has to be personal in order for you to work with me. I think personal and intentional. You have to be intentional about doing this work. You have to be intentional about your reasonings for connecting with me. And I like, what is your origin story? Because again, a lot of the origin stories I hear for people outside of my community is save. And, and who, who gave you a cape is my question. Who gave you a cape? And so it has to be an intentional connection in order for us to build. And that's going to go back to being honest and, and removing the mask as well. You said a mouthful right there. Absolutely. Uh, before Brittany goes, I just want to tell y'all thank you for that, that commentary. I love both of y'all for your authenticity in every moment and your intentionality with every word that comes out of your mouth. So I just appreciate you so much. I'm glad you. Thank you. <laughs> Look, I echo Brandon's sentiments all the way through and through. Um, so Brandon's question was speaking to the village and each of both of you have spoken about like the collective efforts that it takes in supporting our youth. India, you specifically mentioned like you can see like 15 years out and things of that nature. Um, but as we spoke to Kim and Ronnell, they both mentioned Brandon being an important influence in their life, a specific teacher, and a family member such as a mom. But for each of you, like who instilled hope in the importance of dreaming um, for you? Uh, for me, it was my grandmother. 
um, I don't know why I get emotional thinking about it. Um, it was my grandmother. She was a dreamer. She didn't let coming from the South and picking cotton, all the stories that she, she never allowed that to hold her back. One way or another, she was going to be a businesswoman with the six kids at home, working a full-time job. She, Grandma always had a side hustle. Her side hustle probably just stopped about a year and a half ago, like right before COVID. Um, and so she always, always told us to go out and be whatever our heart desires. No, don't let anything stop you. And she always was transparent with us in the fact of... Um, who tried to stop her being in the South and the Jim Crow laws. And she's very honest and we need to get this stuff on paper, the stuff that she has shared, but how they tried to stop her and how she was treated for making a quarter a day and different things like that. And hearing those stories inspire me to keep going. They inspire me to have success and not just uh, in a financial realm, but having success and touching lives and connecting with people. Um, and she's still, my grandmother's 80 years old. She's still inspires me. I took her to church yesterday and it was the first time after, you know, since COVID and she was such a diva and the way that people are attracted to her spirit and her glow. I was like, it would just be an honor to be half of that. But the moment she stepped foot in the door, they wanted to hug her and she didn't want anybody hugging her, but they wanted to hug her and they wanted to love on her. And it's, it's because of her persona and it's because of how she has touched lives at that church since 1976. I think she's been a member there literally. Um, but I, it's so her, the impact that she continues to have, it continues to just shape and mold me into the woman that I want to be and not taking from my mom because she put that in my mother who then you know, put a lot down in me, but that entrepreneurial spirit, the spirit of chasing your dreams, thinking outside of the box, not fitting into the status quo, that all came from my grandmother. For me, <clears throat> and every time I had to write an essay about who my role model was, who I looked up to, I always went blank. This question has always been a struggle for me because I don't have it. I don't have it. People make these assumptions about me because of what I've been able to do. Um, not through me. I give all of it to a higher power, much greater than myself, but people make assumptions about the experiences that I had or the privilege that I was afforded. And I really wasn't, you know, I don't, that's not, I didn't, I don't have those. Uh, so I would say Walt Disney, I don't know how people feel about that, but it's my truth. And I watched the live action um, Mulan yesterday and it just reminded me why I love and appreciate Walt Disney because the messages people might, people, People like to do a lot of saying like the messages are perverted. There's definitely hidden messages in there, but the hidden messages are, are truths that I now understand about how we belittle ourselves and minimize and shrink ourselves and the role that adults play in that shrinking and minimizing of children or the role that trauma plays in there. People are always like, why did the parent die? But it really is the, that trauma that that child experiences early on and how that impacts them and then going through a healing process. And that's literally everybody's journey and then getting back to your greatness and you know, whatever that is, but every single movie, that's what it comes down to. And um, so I'm really just grateful that I've always been an obsessed with Disney kid and continue to be uh, from like watching Soul very recently to, I mean, all of them, like that's just what it's about. Even when you listen to Black is King, Beyonce's, um, the new Lion King album, same thing. The message is always the same. So I might freeze myself and be like Walt Disney. <laughs> well, you you kind of uh, you know transitioned into my last question. So when we 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 talk about trauma a lot, we talked about healing a lot as well. Um, you know, unfortunately, I've worked with you know dozens of young people who are no longer here due to gun violence. I think since 2008, I think I've lost 45 students um, and probably the same number amount to the prison industrial complex. And so last night was really interesting for me on Instagram because one of my students was grieving somebody that he has known that died. And then another one of my students made a post that said, we're the reason your family has teddy bears across the city. Mm. And I, 
I didn't know how to process that. Like that was an immediate trigger for me because I'm like, are you, you're, you're bragging? Like who does that? And so I inboxed him and was like, you need to take that down. And this kid also lost a very close person to him to gun violence. And so I kind of have to remind myself that a lot of the things that young people, that impulsivity, even the desensitization, you know, we talk about that in Power and Promise that it's not that young people are desensitized or that they don't care. It's a survival technique because if they were vulnerable and really affirmed and acknowledged the trauma and the emotions that they feel, they may then be victimized because of that. And so, you know, when we talk to Rondell and Cam and all these other young people, gun violence, depression, and mental health is a number one topic. It is ongoing and it all collects together. So my question for you two, the last question that I have is, why do you think that we don't prioritize social and emotional wellness in young people as we promote it for adults? And what are some solutions to that? And I'm gonna start with Deandra on this one because I know this one hits close to home, but this is also your what you do every day. So kind of talk on, you know, why we're not prioritizing it and then what are some solutions? I think one reason that it's not been prioritized is because we think kids are okay. I, as a mother, uh, after DeAndre was shot, I thought Darius was okay. He asked questions, you know, but I thought he was okay. And as a parent and as an adult, I lost myself in my own trauma. And so that's a big one is, is the adults around, we're losing ourselves in our own trauma and we're forgetting that there are kids who one need us, but hey, they've been impacted too. You know, they may not be the parent, but what is it like to lose a sibling? Or what's it, what is it like to lose your other parent? So I think that we, we lack recognizing that. And, and, and I remember the day I had the epiphany, I said, oh my God, if DeAndre dies, I still have to be Darius's mother. Like it came to me and then that, that pushed me to a whole nother level of resilience. Darius still needed me. And then when I recognized that, I began to see the trauma on Darius who has attempted suicide multiple times since his brother has been shot. Nothing he ever even thought about until he saw the trauma of seeing his brother live debilitated. Seeing my son having to be hospitalized for having manic episodes. And he'll go in there and say, well, mom, it should have been me, not Dre. He was the better kid. And it was not until I had that epiphany, like, wow, for one, Darius needs me, but for two, to let Darius see me cry and to see me hurt. A lot of parents hide that in our support group. They'll say, I cry in the shower. I cry on my way to work because I don't need the kids to see that. And I'm like, no, they need to see that you hurt too. So that they know that it's okay to cry because when they don't, then they begin to act out violently. They begin to, all these things that my baby suppressed in the aftermath of his brother being shot, it came out last year. Oh my God. Holes in the wall, just, just all kind of aggressive behavior. And it led back to, it should have been me, not Dre. And he was only nine. So why would it ever should have been you? you know, in that time. So I think we have to, we have to begin recognizing it. And then we have to, it's going it, to, I believe it takes a village. In our community, in the, in the black and brown community, we need to say it's okay to see a therapist. We need to say it's okay, even if you have to be put on medication, much as, you know, we hate it or, you know, it's, it's okay. It was created for a reason. These people have these educational backgrounds for a reason. So it's okay to go and talk it out. But so many times I hear people say, oh, you got me, you don't need a therapist. You haven't even dealt with your own trauma. So what do you mean I have you, you don't need a therapist. We need to make, make it okay to have that um, outlet and not criticize or, um, again, put a mask over what mental health looks like. And then my last point is it needs to quit being defunded. It's so much defunding when it comes to mental health. I just talked to somebody the other day from CICF. She actually was approaching me about trauma and I was approaching her. I said, I need money. These mother and these kids 
need mental health support and they need access. Providers are not taking Medicaid and people can't afford to pay out of pocket. We need some funding around this issue. So that's one thing to help it is recognizing and creating funding so that people can get that help and making them feel comfortable and reaching out for that kind of support. Yes, I, well, shoot, I wanted you to go last. I wanted you to drop the mic because this is your, your bread and butter is your life. Um, but I would say one, I wish that I was able to have Darius at my school because all that we do is it starts with healing. I, as I heal, my staff heals, as my staff heals, our students actively heal and we give them the tools to then, um, I don't manage trauma as it comes because pain is inevitable, suffering is a choice. And we make sure that we, I emphasize that on a constant basis. Um, but yeah, man, I just wish that we could have had him in an environment like ours because I also, I was highly medicated, identified as bipolar um, my senior year in college. And up until very, very recently would identify these manic and depressed states until I started doing active healing and not through the traditional way, which I don't, not therapists or psychologists, psychiatrists, because I've had all three. Mm -hmm. um, but I also embrace the practices that are innate to my ancestry. And we, we as even a school as an organization are starting to embrace more alternative healing practices that we see are taking over this city right now um, that I've somehow started to lead in that effort. Um, but healing isn't prioritized or embraced among anybody, including adults. Everybody's in denial. Most people walking this earth are in denial about the level of healing that they actually need to engage in. Um, so then like the average American person is repressed, suppressed, and oppressed, no matter your race, age, or ethnicity. Um, then if you happen to be a Black person, it's even more than if you happen to be a Black person who grew up in poverty or experienced any level of violence. It's just like more and more and more on top of that. So then it just needs to be intensified because then I might heal this level, like the what was on the surface, oh, the abuse that was in my home. But under that, there's still the abuse of being in an education system that strips you of yourself and consequences your essence out of you. And then under that, you know that there's so many layers to it. We don't embrace it as adults. And then parents do not like sending their kids to therapy. Doesn't, and again, that's across race, ethnicity, age, everything. They don't want their kids to tell their business because everybody's a liar. Everybody's lying about the realities of their own lives. Kids tell the truth. What they don't want is that truth to be told to the wrong people, even though there are no wrong people. Everybody goes through things. Um, and then, oh, another reason why children are just set up for failures because adults resent kids because their inner child is still very much abused and neglected. And for that reason, adults tend to abuse and neglect other children. These adults are hurt children, neglected children who are then doing that, projecting that onto other children. I don't want you to have freedom because I didn't have it. I don't want you to speak your mind because I wasn't allowed to speak mine. No, you can't eat what you want to eat because I had to eat what my mama cooked. There's all of these things that you hated actually as a child and you would go into your bedroom and scream into a pillow about it, but then you subject your child to it because that's what you had to go through. It is absolutely nonsensical to me. And when I say this to people, they say, well, you don't understand, you don't have kids. And I'm like, exactly. I don't have kids because I wanted to make sure that I was a, a healed person, as healed as I could possibly be before I become someone's parent and perpetuate all of those things that hurt me. And people will think because I've made it this far, I'm not a hurt person, but I've just been dragging my lifeless body, bloodied and burned through this thing because I cannot let another kid go through it. Um, and then my last point is that most of these kids, most of our, especially our black male students who are out here running the streets, they're not in survival mode, they are suicidal. They are depressed. They are some of the most depressed people to walk the earth because they can't win. They can't get it right. They can't please or satisfy anybody, including themselves. They're just so lost because everything they do is to something for somebody. Um, so they are absolutely suicidal and they don't care if they take a life because they don't care if their life is then taken. They actually are asking for someone to do it there. And they're still attached to this hope 
that there is something out there for them. So they don't do it themselves, but that depression and that suicidal inclination kind of want somebody to do it for them. So they are really just straddling this, this thing right now. So I'm on this mission. I started out like just going to the kids because I want to catch you before you become a sucky adult. But at the same time, these adults exist and these adults are running the world. They are most of us. So we have to heal the adults. Otherwise, they're just going to continue to damage the kids and they're going to grow up to be damaged adults. And it's just a nasty cycle that perpetuates itself. And listen, I know we are about to wrap up and I know Brittany's going to have the last question, but I'm so glad that you clarified that. I remember I heard you speak about that on another Zoom call in the way you correlate suicidal behavior to the criminal activity, the violence, it absolutely makes sense. And I think that we really have to start looking at that through that perspective to really prioritize the level of resources that need to be available because it's not simple criminality. It is absolute, absolutely um, a suicide mission. And, Again, thank you for clarifying that. No problem. As you mentioned, Brenda, we've talked about quite a few topics. So we've had mental health, trauma, uh, community partnerships and how to vet those, talked about relationships and aspirations that our youth mentioned in the previous call. So what I'm wondering is what's next? Where do we go from here with the conversation? Um, especially for those who are listening, how do we continue to amplify the voices of our youth? Um, and, and what do you see as your takeaway from today? We'll start off with India. Um, the best thing that people can do to amplify the voice of our youth is like, stop talking. You know, and then that that would be the that would be great. You know, like just move. And that's the same thing I told the district. They're like, "Well, how can we better support you as a school?" And I'm like, "Move out the way," because I'm that kid. You know, like that that kid who move because there's nothing that you can say or do that is going to help. Listen, we have to we have to humble ourselves. We have to understand that we are busy preparing these students for the world as it is. When these kids are trying to prepare us for the world as it should be. And even when they're acting out, they're acting out and saying, this is not right. So since it's not right, I'm gonna burn this down. I'm gonna knock over this table. I'm gonna do this because this isn't right. They're telling us how the world should be. And we need more adults to be encouraged to never grow up. So, you know, people started out trying to shame me for being so childish and being a big kid. Brandon is child, we're big kids. You know, it just is what it is and I embrace it. Yes, I have slumber parties. Yes, I like having fun. I listen to my music, I'm expressive. And it is because I am still 100% in touch with my child. And I don't, like, I will always be her. We don't lose interest. We don't grow out of these things. We don't grow out of joy and freedom. It gets stifled, it gets beat out of us. So we have to encourage other adults to get back to that joy and freedom and just have permission to be themselves. Nobody wants to walk around in a polo on a Saturday night. You know, like, why do we do these things to ourselves? We <laughs> be you, you know, just embrace your you, please. So that's what I would say. And my takeaway from this is that um, healing, healing is at the root of everything for me. And, and I just want everybody who's listening to embrace it fully and know that we're on this journey together. And it's like a movement that is happening where everyone is really openly embracing healing and embracing vulnerability. If that space is not created in your community, be the person to create that space. I had to decide, I'm gonna create this space. And people think I'm crazy, like just post to my 3000 something Facebook friends, like, hey, I'm having a summer party. There's gonna be some self love. Anybody who wants to come can come. You're like, what? You open up your home? I'm protected. I am protected and I know that I am. And this is the only place that I trust that will be safe and positive where women can be vulnerable and there won't be judgment because I control whatever environment I'm in. Um, so we, those spaces have to be created if they don't already exist. Be brave enough to be the person to create that space. Did I miss the Facebook post for the sleepover? 
<laughs> you miss both of them, but it's okay. I'll tag you next time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> June 6th. <laughs> I, uh, I literally, I can show y'all my notes. I wrote down the same thing. I, I wrote down, why is vulnerability abnormal? Why is that an abnormal thing to be vulnerable? And I wrote down, create places and spaces for healing. That's how we're going to get to the bottom. That's how we're going to resolve these things. When I talk to gun violence advocates and leaders all over the country, the places that are seeing a decrease, they're creating spaces for healing. They are going into the communities and literally addressing the trauma and not putting a Band-Aid over it. No one's coming in with a cape trying to save. They're addressing the trauma. And so creating those spaces is, I, I feel like that's how we're going to uh, really get ahead of this thing and, and tell people uh, it's okay to cry for a man. It's okay to cry. It's okay to mourn your father that was gunned down. It's okay to mourn your brother, your cousin, your aunt, your uncle. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with shedding a tear from that. Um, and my takeaway, I think this was uh, incredible and I just really grateful for this space. Um, I feel like I learned so much from the three of you, especially knowing that I'm not the only one who cares as much about trauma and healing. Because rarely am I on a call where people are talking about healing from, this, from our city. Let me say that. No one is talking about getting people healed or starting that journey of healing. So my takeaway is just, being super excited for connecting with like-minded people who see the need for our community to start their journey of healing. Yes. Listen, my cup is overflowing. Mine is. I, I was on the verge of, out of the verge Same. of tears a few <laughs> times. So um, again, I just, I'm excited that we were able to have this conversation. I appreciate um, the three of you um, for, you know, allowing me in this space um, and be able to fellowship and, and just be authentic and share these thoughts. So this has been amazing and I am greatly appreciative. Hey, likewise. Yes, I'm grateful too. And Brenda, we're going to plan our little Kiki too that we'll host at the house. <laughs> I appreciate just I salute both of you queens and the work you all do each day. Um, and I'm super stoked that we had the pleasure to like hear like your stories and your experiences. And as everyone has mentioned, just the vulnerability and transparency. Um, it doesn't go unnoticed for sure. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Mind Matters. We encourage you to keep the conversation going and share your thoughts with us on social media using the hashtag MindMattersTNTP. We look forward to connecting with you during our next conversation. Until then, stay safe, take care of yourself, and remember, your mind matters.